There are often times in modern board gaming when you look at a game and you think, well, that game is definitely not for me. Either it's visually overwhelming, or there's lots of dry tables and tracks with lots of little coloured markers that have to move up and down all the time, or you just simply can't wrap your head around what on earth is going on in the game. The board game that I'm referring to is... Teotihuacan, The City of Gods, the game that changed my mind. Hey Danny, do you want to play this Euro game that I just got? Uh, sure. What's the game about? Well, in the game, we control a set of dice, which function as workers, which move around the board and stop at different locations and resolve actions as we go. At some of the locations, we have to look at this very interesting conversion table where we have to look at the number of dice that are at that location and the lowest pip value of one of our worker dice and try and work out how many resources we're going to collect. Did you say this game was about tables? I've created a massive Excel spreadsheet with all these different formulas that would calculate and analyze every possible move that this game has to offer us. Did I mention that you get to build a way cool pyramid in this game? Why didn't you say so? I'm in! Teotihuacan is a board game full of rectangles. Wherever you look, you're greeted with lots of rectangles. Rectangles here, rectangles there, there are rectangles everywhere. It is a game that takes pride in its four-sided geometry. In Teotihuacan, players are helping to build their beautiful city by managing their die-shaped workers, investing in technology, scaling the three majestic temples, and ultimately completing the Pyramid of the Sun, the centerpiece to the game. Throughout the game, players will be selecting one of their workers and moving them one to three spaces clockwise around the game board. It's just like Monopoly, but instead of one piece, imagine deciding between three pieces to move. It's pretty simple actually. Move your die to the next location and decide to either take the action, gain coca, or lock that die worker away by sending them to the temple to pray. That's it. It's a game of throwing pebbles on a pond and seeing how many ripples you can create. Whenever you decide to resolve an action on a space, you'll need to count how many worker dice of your color are already there. You'll need to look at your lowest pip value amongst the dice that you have. It's like the weakest link. Based on the number of dice you have as well as this pip value, this influences the strength of the action that you can take there. There are three action spaces that provides players with important resources in the game. Gold is useful for decorating the pyramid and investing in technology. Timber is used to build houses for the Avenue of the Dead, and stone is used for contributing to the Pyramid of the Sun. Teotihuacan is like a gloriously decorated Excel spreadsheet, with boxes to tick, formulas to insert, and calculated moves to be solved. It's like solving one of those puzzle box Rubik's Cubes, but in two dimensions. Building the Pyramid of the Sun is like building the ultimate wedding cake. The more you contribute to it, the more points you gain, the higher up you build. Placing tile pieces and covering icons of the same type nets you points. Placing the tile on a higher level nets you more points. And placing a colored temple icon on a matching one allows you to ascend up the colored tracks, earning even more victory points, coca, and resources. As Dirk Gently, a famous character written by Douglas Adams, author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, would say, everything is connected. Contribute to the Avenue of the Dead, gain victory points. Buy a set of masks gain victory points. There are so many racetracks in this game that it can often feel like you're playing multiple carnival games at once. Be ahead on the pyramid track and gain four victory points as well as victory points for each level you've progressed. Move up the avenue of the dead and multiply those victory points. This game does have a lot to keep track of. All of these cogs mishmash together to create an interesting puzzle to unlock. Every mechanic builds on another mechanic. Clustering your dice nets you larger rewards. You are literally and metaphorically climbing a resource ladder into the heavens. Whenever you take certain actions, you can increase the value of your pips on your workers, which also increases your power level. And if your dice worker ever gets to six, they ascend, unlocking more workers and other cool bonuses to choose from. So, Teotihuacan is a cool rectangular shaped game that is far from being just two dimensional. There are five big revelations that I uncovered whilst journeying through this monster of a game. And if you're sitting there thinking, whoa, this looks like a lot, 
You're definitely right, because when I first looked at this game, it definitely looked really imposing, really busy, and I was thinking, how on earth will I ever wrap my head around it? And do you know what? This game really surprised me. It's actually a little bit easier to learn than I thought. I thought the learning curve was going to be super steep, but actually this, the curve of this game actually isn't so bad. The one thing that I really tried to get my head around first was movement. You basically pick a die, move your worker from its location one to three spaces around the circuit, and then decide if you're going to get coca or if you're going to resolve an action. If you can kind of start from that point, then the game starts to become a little bit more digestible. The other thing that you've got to get your head around is the table. And there are three action tiles that actually use the table in the same way. So if you know how one of the tables works, you know how three of the action tiles work. And so once I saw that connection, I started to ease into the game. Knowing how many dice you've got at that location and what your pip value is to get the resources that you need, you can kind of apply your knowledge of this tile with the other resource tiles out on the board. And surprisingly, the rulebook was actually quite easy to go through, and as you kind of understood how each of the parts of the board work, the fact that they all connect together in some way just makes it easier to learn. Uh, Danny, what are you doing? Uh, I'm hoping to pass go and collect $200. I think that's a different game. Here, have 200 coca instead! The second big discovery that I made was understanding how incredibly impactful your dice workers are. The meaningful use of dice as they move around the board and then as you cluster the dice together to compound the effect and then to upgrade and um, ascend your dice makes for some really weighty decisions. You know, being able to leave a die in one space and then hopefully another die will appear in the same area giving you a more powerful effect means that your moves have to be planned almost in a three-step process. Place a die worker here to gain coca based on how many other different colored workers there are. Move a second die to that location later on and get more resources. And then move a third die to that same location and get even more resources. That whole element of stepping stones and moving these dice in such a really cool, uh, planned and integrated way just really speaks thematically to me. The fact that every time you decide what to do with your three workers, whether you're going to lock that worker away to upgrade on the temple tracks and to get bonus discovery tiles, or even to use that worker to fill up another space so that the following workers from the other players who go to that same space are going to have to pay more coca if they want to use it. That element of getting in each other's way is super brilliant. And the fact that you can kind of piggyback on your own workers to increase the magnitude of the resources that you get just makes for some very pyramidal shaped decision making. The best way to kind of describe it is like visiting a concert. If you're on your own, you're not going to get really much out of it. But as you bring more followers along and jo let them join your party, all of a sudden becomes a great experience. Oh, I'm glad to see you're enjoying this game. I'm so excited. I get to put this piece on the top of the pyramid. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm so happy. This is definitely going to go in my top five euros of all time. And so my friends, this is where my third discovery absolutely shows how brilliant this game can be. This game is all about building a pyramid. In fact, that theme of pyramid building is emanated through every facet of this game. First of all, you've got this beautiful domino pyramid that you're building in the center of the board. It is like the centerpiece, the wedding cake of all board games. As you're placing and purchasing them in layers, you're gaining more points for the higher you place those dominoes. And if you place a colored icon onto a matching icon, you get to move up the temple tracks. And if you put matching icons on top of each other, you also get to gain extra victory points. There is a pyramid effect when as your dice move around the board and as they land on the resource spaces, the fact that those resources compound as you put one die, two die and three die, that pyramid and compounding effect becomes so evident. 
The idea that when you move up the avenue of the den and at the end of every eclipse, you multiply that level with the face-up victory point value on this avenue of the dead track means you are scoring multi-layered points. Everything is graded in some way. You contribute a little, you're only gonna get a little. If you contribute a lot, you're gonna get a whole bucket load of treasure. And this is where the game just really grabs you and locks you in and says, you know what? This is a box worth unboxing. This is a grid worth dabbling in. This is a pyramid worth climbing and discovering. In particular, the tech tiles are ones that really reshape your ability and your efficiency. You can build some really cool engines in this game where if you uh, invest in particular technology early on in the game, you can then uh, use other action spaces which will then net you bonuses that help you to optimize every move that you make. And this game is about move optimization. If you're gonna just move a die just to only get some coca, is that the best move overall? Or is it better to move another die into another spot to help you set up a more powerful move later on? So I pay my resources and place this tile on the pyramid to net me five victory points. I guess you could say that I'm ahead of the pack. Seriously? One of the biggest gripes that I have with a lot of Euro games is the fact that there's a lot of boards. You have a board, another player has a board, there are three central boards. I mean, sometimes there can be too many boards, let's be honest. And sometimes when there's too many boards, your mind has to be kind of split and divided across three or four different spaces. And that can kind of lead to analysis, paralysis, uh, people trying to, you know, people missing certain rules, just because everything is kind of split all over the place. The beauty of Teotihuacan is the fact that there is only one board that all players look at. And that is something that really sings to me. I only have to look at one place, and so does the player on my left, and so does the player on the right. And that we're all trying to look at this rotating puzzle all at the same time. And I can just dedicate 100% of my focus to what is happening on this central map. And so does the person next to me. They can see how my dice have moved and I can see how their dice have moved and I can kind of tactically uh, decide how to move my dice on my next turn. They played a lot of other Euros. A lot of the time players have their own board and they kind of dabble in their own little side activities while everyone over there is trying to do their own little side activities and sometimes that lack of interaction means the game feels like it's a multiplayer solitaire. Whereas this game has that cool medium level of interaction, which doesn't really hurt you too much in the long run. Yes, you'll have to pay extra coca if that's a space you really want to use, but you know what? It's worth it. And I love those little subtle decisions that you have to make. And the fact that we are all trying to solve the same puzzle, but from different perspectives. Like, oh, whoa, I need to get those logs and then use those logs to purchase more buildings to then go up the Avenue of the Dead track. Whereas the player next to me is thinking, oh, how am I going to get to the top of that blue temple track to get those 15 victory points? All of those perspectives somehow in this game just overlap. It's a brilliant puzzle to solve because you're trying to solve it almost in four different ways. Oh, the fifth discovery is probably the most important one and it's one that people often search for and look for when they're considering buying a heavy euro and that is replayability. This game has lots of modular ways to reshape the board to make each game feel different. The fact that you can kind of move these particular tiles around to shape the geography and the landscape of the game just means that every tactic that you've used in your previous game is probably going to have to change for the next, including these little palace tiles. You can change the sort of effects that you can place on there. I think this game does have a lot of different avenues for winning. However, in saying that, those avenues for winning aren't always all relatively balanced. The mask strategy in the base game tends to be a little bit weak. And also, if you don't somehow invest in the pyramid in some way or up some of the temple tracks, you are gonna find that you're gonna fall behind. So there are some things that you have to dabble in and there are other things where you can kind of optionally, you know, go in and out and test it out. You know what? Rectangular shaped games, and there's a lot of rectangles in this game, aren't as bad as I initially thought. And hey Danny, I got a really great idea for a brand new board game. Picture this. Rectangles. 
the board game. I think it needs a little bit of work. How about Quadrilateral, the board game? I love it. I definitely see how if you've played other games like Zolkin, Tekenu, uh, and now Tetuakan, the fact that this kind of rondel dice activation system is something that kind of emanates and is reflected in those other two games. So, what board games have you avoided over time? Please let me know and I'd love to hear them in the comments section below. If you really like my wholesome board game content, then please consider heading over to my Patreon page and supporting me on Patreon. I would absolutely truly appreciate it and I really enjoy producing this content for you out there and connecting with you. Thanks once again for joining me for another Board Game Sanctuary review. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Can't wait to chat to you guys soon. Goodbye!